Good afternoon. I am so excited to introduce this lady. I've known her probably all of the years that she's been in Tupelo, and that's about 30 years. But Dr. Kathy Grace, she's currently the co-director of the Graduate Center for the Study of Early Learning at North Mississippi Education Consortium on the campus of Ole Miss. I had to read that so I can make sure I got it right. But she's worked over 45 years in the field of early childhood development. And her resume, she cut it short for me and I'll let her talk about it, but she has worked in early childhood education. She served as the first director of the Family Resource Center because she knew the importance of such an organization and worked with CREATE and public schools in Lee County as well as Tupelo. She has served as the national director of early childhood policy at the Children's Defense Fund and the early childhood coordinator at the Mississippi Department of Education. Dr. Grace is currently involved in developing and providing a professional development to early childhood educators across the state. During her career, she has written grants and received over 40 million with an M in grants toward the improvement of education for young children in the state. And I, I think Dr. Grace has brought the importance of early childhood education to the state more than anybody else to our legislators and whomever. So would you please welcome today, Dr. Kathy Grace. Good afternoon, or almost afternoon, it is afternoon. Uh, I know many of you from other activities, church and other uh, presentations that I've made uh, in town and uh, across the state as well. And thank you, Zell, for inviting me and for allowing me to come. <clears throat> the information that we're going to be looking at today is going to be a new PowerPoint behind me, and we're going to watch a video for about four to five minutes that sums up, I think, better than most anything I've seen, how early childhood education is connected to industrial development, and the development of a community. Now, many of you may say, now that's a stretch because what could little children and their education have to do with uh, what we're doing at Cooper Tire or what we're doing over here at the hospital? Uh, but I will promise you that after you hear what we've got to say or I've got to say today, it will give you pause to think. One of the things that I have come across in the 40 something years uh, that I've been doing this is that the communication gap is wide between industry, business leaders, as, uh, and early childhood educators. Because it takes a while for the development of a young child to show up in the industry because they have to grow up before they can come to work. Two times since I've been involved in early childhood education in this state has there been a tragedy that brought home the point of the importance of early care and education to a community's development. One time was with Katrina, and I spent three years down on the coast helping those people on the coast to rebuild the early childhood industry down there and also to work with people who had social emotional uh, traumas that some of them still suffer from today as a result of loss of home, loss of business, and uh, just the fact that some of their family members perhaps were either hurt or killed as a result of Katrina. The other one is probably some that most of us are still wrestling with, and that is the pandemic. Uh, I asked them before I came, I said, do I wear a mask or not? Because, you know, sometimes you wear a mask, sometimes you don't. I've been vaccinated, I'm good, I promise. Uh, but <clears throat> the impact that has had on the education of children across the country, particularly here in Mississippi, where we are struggling with some school districts not having access to broadband in the degree that the children needed it. Uh, some school districts not having the internal capacity to meet the needs of the children, and I could go on and on, but that's not why I'm here today. Why I'm here today is to help you as business people, and I don't think I have to say this but once, realize that when the workers can't get to the job because nobody's there to help take care of their children, 
and you got a problem. Because you can't run your business if the people who are working for you aren't there. Now, if you have school-age children and you're employed, the schools were, were suffering. They had to depend on some of the child care facilities to help take care of children whose parents were working, who couldn't leave their child at home alone. We had child care facilities who actually had to close or cut out certain ages because they didn't have the workers. Because the workers were either sick or they were unable because they were caring for people in their homes that were sick. And so we had a problem. Now, whether or not it touched you personally or not, but I can tell you, we did a survey of child care providers in May, right at the, I guess you could say, height of all this. And there were close to 40% of our child care providers in the state that were closed. Now, that was temporary, but it's still slow coming back. So if, if I was a person in an industrial or a business position, I would start to rethink, have I even thought about my employees and where and what are they doing for their child in terms of care and in terms of quality education? Because it could affect you from the standpoint of they may not be able to come to work. Now, hopefully we never have any tragedies like the two I've mentioned again, but I wanna pick up on the importance of what early childhood education can do in results in resulting to prepare good workers, which is what you're interested in. Um, I have a, a pretty, uh, I guess you could say, interesting Sunday school class that I've been teaching for 25 years. And yesterday, one of them brought to the table the fact that they had read in the state of Kansas, they had done a survey, and that almost 60% of the people working could not read a tape measure. Does that seem outrageous to you? Okay, why? Why can't they read a tape measure? Probably because they hadn't been taught way back. Or they haven't had application reasons to apply. Uh, we've got to look at things, and you all as business people, and I say most of you are business people. Some of you may be uh, people who you don't consider it as a business person, but I do. Uh, we need your help to talk to educators and to help support the fact that children learn much earlier than we once thought. My children are 40 and 50 something years old. What we know now about how young children learn was not even thought of when I was raising my children. We didn't give them enough credit, basically. They know a lot more, a lot sooner than what we thought. So can I ask you to switch the slides for me? Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to read, not read to you, but I'm going to go over this. And I have a little uh, box in the middle of my screen that keeps me from being able to read. I don't know if you can touch it to make it go to tell me the meeting's being recorded. Uh, but uh, I will touch on things I've just said. Child care is the backbone of the local economy. Any little town, big town, it probably you hadn't thought of it that way. But I can tell you when the man from Chevron who was over there public affairs came to me during Katrina and said, you know, just because the schools are back up again, I can't get my people to come back because their children don't go to school. They're too young. So where are they going to go? So that man with Chevron understood during Katrina, he had to do something for all of his employees for them to come back to work. So again, what is the connection uh, between you as a, a viable business, one that's going to grow, one that's going to look forward instead of just being satisfied with the status quo. Now, we also need to look at and what's been a hot topic so far, and I know that this is going to stop very shortly in our state as far as paying folks that additional dollar uh, in terms of helping them get out of the hole. Mississippi is one of five states that uh, goes with the minimum wage set by the federal government. And that is $7.25 an hour. Now, where you are employed, you may pay more than that. Uh, you may pay $8.50 an hour. Well, I work with parents, two parent families that are working two jobs, 
And when a child care daily or a weekly child care fee for the care of an infant is $140 to $160 a week, there's no way that they're going to be able to pay through that, making that kind of money. Now, there are state programs to help a certain group of, of individuals, but that is why, and I'm going to speak more to this, why the money that is coming in now through the Recovery Act is going to change the day, if we're smart, for all of the folks involved in community development, not just early childhood, but community development. Now, if we look at the, the overall view of industry in Mississippi in terms of how many businesses support early care and education, either through like uh, the hospital where there's an on-site facility, uh, there used to be one at the newspaper with a couple of businesses that went together. Whether or not you provide your employees a stipend or uh, the fact that they have three underage, other school age children, whether or not you provide some training dollars for early care and education providers that are working with employees uh, in your business. There's all kinds of ways to do this, but it doesn't mean that you just have to give them flat out cash. It means that you can support them through providing stipends for their uh, provider staff to get more training. So if we're creative and innovative, then we can help with a partnership that we haven't currently realized in, in Tupelo. Uh, so one of the lessons that we've learned from COVID is the importance of early childhood to the economic health of a community. Because once again, if they aren't there to work, you can't be open. And if they don't have anywhere for their children to be during the day, then they can't come. There are several stories I could tell you about children who were trying to be homeschooled during this pandemic using Zoom, where they were the ones that were also the babysitters. So they had to leave their class to go take care of their baby brother because mama and daddy were at work. Now that doesn't bode well, but that is where we were at that time because mama and daddy had to go to work. So what are we going to do to be able to ensure that we are growing good thinking people at the same time that we are supporting the people that you have deemed worthy of your employees? Okay, thank you. You can turn flip me again. Now, the National Institute of Early Childhood Education called NEAR is a research outfit out of New Jersey. They look at all of the states in the country that have a pre-K program. And Mississippi has one of the highest ranking programs in the country. We have met all of their 10 research benchmarks. We are doing an excellent job, but we don't serve very many children because we haven't got a lot of state dollars invested in this program. Uh, <clears throat> right now, that pre-K program is voluntary. It's not required. It won't ever be required of parents to bring their children there. But it's based on a partnership between the public schools, Head Start, and private providers. There's one in Monroe County, and there's one in Octubahop County, and there's one up in Conn, uh, as far as this, this part of the state. <clears throat> and if you wanted to look at the Department of Education's reports on how well children do when they come to kindergarten, Every one of the children who have been in a pre-K collaborative program, as they call it, the state program, those children's scores are considerably higher than children who have attended other types of programs that are for four-year-olds. Now, again, we have invested more this year when the legislature turned over uh, additional dollars, where I think we're up to about $19 million to support this pre-K program. That sounds great. Arkansas has over $40 million. Alabama has over $50 million for the same program, for their pre-K program. We have not really understood the investment that this can yield. It is not a fluffy, funny, little sweet program for kids. And, and look, I've been around here a long time, and I know some of you, and I know some of you thinking like that. That's all she knows to talk about is little children. I wish she could talk about growing, grow, uh, growing fruit or something sometime when she got up to talk. But that's not what I know about. But I do know about this. And so as of, 
as of this year, starting up when in 22, 2022, 23, we will have 16% of our four-year-olds in one of these pre-K state funded programs is what the money is there for right now. And that's about 6,000 children. Well, on average, we have 40,000 children a year born. That doesn't mean they all stay, but then we have some that move in here and so forth. But there are good programs around. The question is, how is the access for these children to be able to get in them? And again, that's a question I pose. Okay, if you could hit me again. Now, we're going to look at a video that I hope will bring this home to you in ways that perhaps you haven't thought of in terms of what skills, brain development type skills, do you need in a good worker? And where this development actually begins. We'll make sure you can hear this, hopefully. <laughs> At the center of this dynamic architecture are a set of skills called executive function and self-regulation. Children's self-regulation and executive function are key ingredients in their lifetime performance. It's not just about learning language or learning numbers or learning colors. We have to be able to work effectively with others with distractions, with multiple demands. These actually are skills that contribute to the productivity of the American workforce. Look at your shapes. What should you have done next? Educators, I think, are, are looking for just this sort of thing. And when we describe what we mean by executive function, they say, yes, that's it. That's exactly you know, yeah. the problem. These kids, they can tell it. me these rules, but they can't actually use them. What's this? What is executive function? The safety goggles. Safety goggles. Probably the best way to think about it is sort of like an air traffic control system in the brain. Just like an air traffic control system has to manage lots of airplanes going on lots of runways and really exquisite timing and so on, a child has to manage a lot of information and avoid distractions. We really think of it as involving working memory and inhibitory control and mental flexibility. Take a situation where a child is having to take turns. So first of all, the child has to have inhibitory control. The child has to be able to stop whatever he or she is doing and let the other child take a turn. But when it's your turn again, you also have to remember what it is you're supposed to be doing. So that pulls on working memory. If the children who are taking the turns after you do something unpredictable, you have to be able to adjust what you're going to do next. And that requires mental flexibility. Children who are struggling with these capacities um, often look like children who just aren't paying attention or children who are deliberately not controlling themselves. If you don't have self-regulation, you act out and the teacher puts you in timeout and so then you miss part of the learning that's going on and then you are more upset because you're behind and so you act out and so you get this downward spiral. How does executive function develop? Six, seven, seven, and plus four. In little children and even, you know, in the infant and toddler years, you begin to see the roots of executive functioning skills. What's going on in our brains is unbelievably intricate and complicated. The prefrontal cortex, or the front third of the brain, is important for executive function. But it's more than just prefrontal cortex. 
This region doesn't act alone. It's involved in controlling your behavior through its interactions with all other parts of the brain. The brain goes from a situation where you've got nearest neurons communicating very strongly with each other and ignoring the rest of the brain to these widespread networks that are connecting these different areas. Executive function changes over the life course. It improves radically over the first few years. I got a match prime. Uh, it continues to improve throughout adolescence. It's not until early adulthood that you have the adult type networks that are very strongly activated that connect different brain regions together. Let's take notes. Also, we believe that executive functions can be trained. It's just like going to the gym. So the more you practice in these areas, the stronger the capacity is likely to become because you're helping to strengthen those neural connections. Uh -huh. You're at 24. Slowly but surely, you're going to be able to step back and that child's going to go into the world with these skills where they can get along with other people, change rules, and they can be flexible, and they can accomplish new things, and they're unafraid. I got bit by my dog in my arm. Oh, dear. If we don't learn these skills during the childhood and adolescent years when they're coming online, we are really ill-equipped as an adult to hold a job, to maintain a marriage, <laughs> to raise children, to get along with each other, to basically be part of a civil society. You're okay. As Zell mentioned, I started, was fortunate enough to be in a position to help start the Family Resource Center almost 30 years ago. And uh, there were some very good people that worked with me at that time. I talked with uh, human resource people in Tupelo that were employed that time. at that time. Some of them are probably retired now. And I said, what is it that you need in a worker? And every one of them said to me, to get along with each other. They get mad and they just walk off. And then they think I'm supposed to hire them back. I also was told if they could just shut their mouth and quit trying to start something. Now, they're not talking about children. They're talking about the people that they hire. I still talk with human uh, resource people that are in my Sunday school class and in, that I know along the way. That hasn't changed. We can, I'm told, you can teach them the skill in a line to do whatever it is that they have to do. But it's not the workplace's uh, position to teach them executive functioning skills. That's exactly what that is. How flexible are they? How can they discern what's something that's important and what's just a bunch of junk? How can they be uh, present? I just didn't feel like coming yesterday. Sorry. You heard that one before? Well, people tell me that happens sometimes. <clears throat> That's not to say that being irresponsible can be fixed by having a good early childhood program. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the skills for problem solving for thinking in a divergent way, which I think most of you would expect employees to be able to do, those skills begin to be built when they are young children. And to ignore that fact is hurting us as a community. It's hurting you as a business person. <clears throat> now, uh, James Heckman, who may, if you have a degree in economy or economics, or if you are familiar with any of the Nobel Prize winners, James Heckman won the Nobel Prize for his work on human resource efficiency and capacity. And basically what he said was the best investment that any community or country could make would be in early childhood education. He said that brain integrity in the first years of life is, is critical. 
and that early childhood programs can substantially reduce achievement gaps and produce a better child in terms of performance. And he also said this, which you may or may not agree with. He says 20% of people contribute to 80% of our social and health problems in this country. Would you agree with that? 20% contribute to 80% problems. Now, a guy at Harvard named Jack Shonkoff, and if you're interested in this, look it up. He has now looked at the importance of early care and education as it looks over lifespan in terms of our health, our mental health, as well as our physical health. And how if we don't learn how to cope and manage uh, the things that you saw in executive functioning development, it, it can literally make us sick. High blood pressure, ulcers, having problems with uh, relationships, coping through alcohol or drugs that lead to another set of problems. Basically what Dr. Heckman says is that the, <clears throat> the rate of interest on the for what you would invest is 13% for birth to five programs, which is a higher rate of return than on preschool programs alone. But what if you what if you could invest in something to get a 13% return? <laughs> whatever it is, whatever it is, stocks, bonds, coins, whatever, and you could get 13% return. Most people wouldn't turn away from that. But that's what we've been doing because we don't understand up until now, hopefully we do, the critical need for early, quality early care and education, quality early care and education, and how that affects workers down the line and in the future. Okay, if you can turn again for me. Now, what's next for early care and education in Mississippi? The American Rescue Plan of 2021, which you know has been passed, and this is where, and this is the best kept secret so far. I'm sure it will get out shortly. Mississippi is going to receive more than a half a billion dollars, not million, billion dollars for early care and education to support child care centers in Mississippi. Schools, and Zell and I were talking about, schools are going to get, we don't know how much, but there is a lifespan for this fund, for these funds, only three years. So there has to be a plan and it has to be executed. And it has to be where it can be sustainable because nobody wants to lead somebody down the road and then all of a sudden the bridge is out and they have to either turn around or they fall down in the hole. So what can be done at community levels to help sustain what has started through this unprecedented boost to early care and education in Mississippi. We know right now child care workers average uh, around $9 an hour. We, regardless if they have a college degree or not, that's what you get average, $9 an hour. It's hard to keep people in an early care and education program when they can gut catfish and make more. And that is the honest truth. So what are we going to do? As a community, what are we going to do to help plan, sit down with uh, CDF, sit down with groups of, of people out in the county, or supervisors, whatever, to say, okay, this amount of money is going to come into the child care providers who choose to take it. They don't have to be forced to take it, but who choose to take it to improve their programs and to serve more kids who ordinarily couldn't come. So at the end of three years, are we going to tell that child that's born the year after tough, you missed out, you should have been born earlier. What is going to be the continuation of this? If you're not having the child care people sit at the table with you, or you're not sitting at the table with them when plans are conducted, then it's going to be a huge disconnect and we'll have people fuss at that sit there, they just threw that money at them and now it's all gone, it's all gone. It's our fault if it's all gone at the end of three years. Because if you're getting advance notice that this is time to plan, seriously plan with folks who are early care and education professionals outside the school district. 
that's not to exclude the school district, but I'm talking about people who are serving children that aren't in school yet, even at four years old. So I'm challenging you to think about this and think about it in terms of when you're doing your business plans, when you're doing your five-year projections, whatever. How are you going to fit this in? Okay, if you can give us one more slide. Now, this is my contact information if you ever wanted to talk to me or email me. But I'm going to save, I'm saving this one for the, for the last. I have been trying to work with the city and with others uh, around the need at Hilldale Apartments. Y'all know where Hilldale is? It's in Tupelo, Mississippi. It's not too far from Thomas Street, but it's too far for Thomas Street to be able to extend their broadband to them. They'd have to come to the parking lot in the school if they were going to use it. That park apartment building is owned by some people in New Jersey. It's not owned by the city. And I've talked to Mayor Shelton several times. I've called New Jersey several times. And I basically got up as far as the receptionist to the vice president who told me that I'd have to go through the Mississippi reps. And I had been through the Mississippi reps who told me to call the New Jersey people. So if you develop a theme here, it's like, we ain't fooling with y'all because you don't live close to us. And you know, this is what you got. We have had an offer from Early Head Start to donate furniture. We've had some uh, interest from the United Way and from some others to help us support a part-time uh, staffing for a three hour a day program for infants, toddlers, three and four year olds in that apartment complex. Two years ago, Shelly Brooks and I went there and talked with Miss Darcy, the social worker. There are 50 children at that time, 50 children that were under the age of five in that complex. Head Start and Tupelo no longer transports. So that means if you wanted to go over here on Green Street, you wouldn't be able to have anybody to pick you up. One of the main problems over there is there's not transportation. Families don't have the transportation. Now, if they can get to the school district and have a birth certificate, they can get their child at ECEC when they're four and the bus will come get them from school <laughs> for the four-year-old work. But we know from brain development that four is not soon enough. We need to start when they're born or earlier as possible, as early as possible. So I'm giving you a real straightforward challenge. Gildale Apartments, what can be done to cause, cause enough commotion to get somebody to say, and this is what we were asking for. We were asking for one apartment that we could use as a child care facility that would be three hours in the morning. And then three hours in the afternoon for children that would be after school to do things with them. They said, no, can't yeah, do it. The problem is that the housing, uh, the U.S. Housing Department allows that to happen. We used to do it at Green Street. Years and years and years ago, we used to do that. But this is the choice that they've made who owns Hilldale Apartments. So I'm not trying to fuss at the city because they, they don't own it. But Jason did say, well, there's some land close to there, like right over there that the city does own. And if the Board of Supervisors or the City Council, excuse me, if the City Council or others were in the mood, then they could maybe look at how they could put up a, a, trans, a, a building that would be uh, like something the Eighth the, and the Pope could help with. And then they could be right there on the campus of the apartment. That was an, uh, an idea. But this needs to come to the forefront in terms of Right here in this town, we've got children who are getting no services. And Thomas Street is about a mile, which again, that's not for two and three year olds. Head Start is right over here on the other side of town, but they don't bus. So we still got children that are in the lurch. So I challenge you uh, to think about that. And I know as smart as this room is, there could be several ways to address this problem within three months. But again, y'all know how to get in touch with me. Zell knows how to get in touch with me. And I thank you so much for giving me time. I know you've got to get back to work, but this has been a, a real joy for me to be able to talk to all of you. And uh, Mr. Way just knows all about all this early childhood stuff because he's on the board with me with uh, Shelley Brooks and the, what they're doing here uh, with the childcare facility. So 
one of your own we can talk to you about. But thank you again very much. Are there any questions? Yes. Is there any way that industry, obviously, if they recognize the importance of it, and it helps their workforce, protecting them. <coughs> Could there not be tax incentives there so some of this be approached through industry as opposed to the law for education? Or is that too much problem? It's not a problem if you sit down and talk to Chad. And because that is a, a, a state issue. Now, if they wanted to do something for Lee County, you know, specific, then that would be still something that would have to be done through what Chad does. I will tell you briefly, the town of Petal, Mississippi, y'all are familiar with Petal outside of Hasbro. Many years ago, they deemed that one-tenth of one percent of their, of their city taxes would go toward early care and education, and it would be managed through the school system. But it was for children under school age. That has gone through four mayors, I think, and I don't know how many different people elected. And that yields about $45,000 a year for the early childhood education uh, advancement in Pebble. Pebble has been number one in the state in their school district rankings for several years. So I say to you, there are ways to do it either locally or at the state level. But it would have to be something that we could sit down with Chad and, and talk about how that could be done. Uh, but there's nothing to me is fair game. Any way you can think about doing it, we need to be as innovative as possible because when you think about over a half a billion dollars, if this was a car plant coming to town or this was some big industry, people would be jumping all over each other to think that. But it's not all coming to Tupelo. It's not all coming to Lee County, but there will be a sizable amount that will be there to boost early care and education, but it's only for three years. So the plan should be, how do we go on past when the money is no longer available in the way that it currently is? Okay. Yes, then. So the question, right now, kindergarten is required. What motions or steps need to be in place to make pre-K well, I don't want to shock you, but kindergarten is not required. The public school is required to offer kindergarten. So that's why we have public school classes all over the state, because the State Department requires, because the law, 1982, the format says that it has to be offered. But attendance in kindergarten is only mandatory if you start your child the first of the year and you register Rob to go to kindergarten. And then you decide in October, well, it's too much trouble for me to get up every morning. I'm just going to pull him out. Then you're subject to the uh, truancy regulation. But if you never start him, then he's not required to go. That puts it on the first grade teacher to have children who've been in kindergarten, children who've been in pre-K, and children who've been nowhere. So that's quite a, a gap. Uh, right now, the pre-K emphasis is to try to promote the state collaborative so that child care facilities and Head Start facilities will not lose their children. They'll only grow their children because they'll all be in this together. Because some child care providers say, well, the school's gonna take all my children and I'm gonna be out of business. They won't be with this model. They have a chance to be part of it and even benefit from it. And the people over in Monroe County, their businesses have actually grown. The, the child care businesses have grown because they have uh, degree teachers that are teaching in their child care center that this grant is paying for. Yes. But, but you bring up a point of inspection there. You've got child care centers and you've got free k educators. So sometimes in child care centers, other than just babysitting, are, are, are not doing the education part, which is so important. My, my wife was a preschool. Uh, Director for 29 years. So I understand the point. Maybe catch me two years old and up. But, but is, is, is that governed by the state some way uh, to help distinguish between a learning center and a, just a daycare center? The state has what is developing now is called a continuous quality improvement 
which is there will be required, not yet, but there will be requirements for quality indicators in the child care centers that receive the funds from the state. But if they're there operating without any assistance, they have to uh, uh, abide by licensing regulations, but those regulations are for health and safety. They're not necessarily quality as you're talking about. But if that child care center is part of the statewide collaborative, they have to meet the very same standards that the public students do, or they won't be in it anymore. And they have actually escorted people out of them because they didn't meet the quality standards. The child care people would say to you, I'm all for it, but how can I keep my employees here? It's a constant turnover because we don't pay. Then that gets back into, well, is that going to be on the back of the parent? Well, when the parent's making $8 an hour in some of the jobs, then they can't afford to pay. So therefore, it's just, it's just a, uh, people call it a trilemma. Yes, Tom. It's not part of the issue of the parents also need to understand their children need this education. You know, we're, we're, we're providing them with kindergarten. We have certain preschool. We feed them breakfast. We feed them up. We do a lot of things. I completely agree with what we do. But, but it just seems to me that that there is less and less parental responsibility other than having a good time and bring home babies. Well, I, let me just say this. I can't speak for all the parents. As you know, because parents, and, and I will say that what has gone on in the last, this pandemic, as an example, <clears throat> I think a lot of folks have started to realize that part of the parent lack of involvement, the lack of engagement, has been because the parents nor the school people had enough time to sit down and really have relationships to talk about what their job is, what their role is as parents. And with the Zoom meetings now, the parents were there. The, the teachers got, the teachers have said they've done stuff. The teachers have said they know their children a lot better this year and their families than they ever did before because they're actually in their homes. If they did the, uh, the virtual, they were in their homes. But I think if you looked at <clears throat> children that are not just low income children, children from all different uh, income levels, we have not done the best job we could in educating the role, the, educating the parents to understand their roles are critical from before the baby's born. And certainly they're on that. But I also say, and, and you all could disagree, that we're in a part of the country where there's a lot of, of credence given to the elders. So in other words, if my grandmama says that I can give this baby pickle juice, then he's getting pickle juice. And in, actually, that happened to me when I was at the Banner Resource Center. I got in a fight with a mama who was going to give that baby turnip green juice, and that was going to be it. And, you know, we, we have, uh, when I was in Amory, I had to talk to a granddaddy, talk hard to that granddaddy to get that little boy to come to the preschool in Amory. He didn't talk. He didn't use a, a spoon. He ate his food like a dog would. But that was okay in that culture. So I think that we have a double, double duty here about sometimes uphill with the cultural part, as well as um, being more, and, and what I try to do is to look at it from a standpoint, if I was this person's shoes, what would it take to get me to get motivated? What could somebody say to me that would, would help me along the way? Um, I, I think that it is very complicated. I'm, I'm not trying to dismiss the complications around the home environment and how important that is. But I do know, and I think y'all have seen on television and you've read, mothers and daddies have become uh, greater advocates for teachers after this year, uh, in some cases, than they had before because they were at home trying to teach while they were doing their jobs as well. So um, I know it's time for y'all to go, but I thank you for your questions and I'll take any more questions. I'll sit over here till tomorrow. Thank you.